Okay, good morning. So I'm Emily Argo, and I'm from Townsend, Massachusetts. Uh, at COA, I focus my studies on the marine environment, and I eventually developed my senior projects, where I looked at the biology, life history, genetics, and conservation of the spiny dogfish here in the Gulf of Maine. My senior project is a culmination of work I've done with the species for near, nearly two years now. I started working with the dogfish as part of an intensive two-week spring break course held here on the island at Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory. And from there, I did an independent study and then an internship at MDIBL. So my senior project brings this all together as a way to showcase some of the skills I've learned while I've been at COA. Um, I had two parts to my senior project. The first was a presentation at a statewide scientific conference held here at MDIBL. And the second was a written report. Uh, for this presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, the history of the dogfish, as uh, the fishery of the dogfish, an analysis of trawl data, the results of research looking at pup development, and finally, work I did looking at genetic variation on different spatial scales. So the spiny dogfish is a small migratory shark that can be found both above and below the equator, and on this map, the areas in red show where the dogfish can be found in the highest density globally. Uh, it's a schooling species. You can see that from the picture on the right. However, I wouldn't feed them like the diver's doing. That might not be good for you. Um, and uh, there's uh, one unique characteristic of the dogfish, which is its gestation period. And it's close to two years. And after that, they give birth to live young, which we commonly call pups. Uh, the dogfish is mostly found in Maine, uh, in the Gulf of Maine during our summer months. Um, it migrates northward from locations south of Cape Cod. Dogfish are strange animals. They used to be a hated pest, then fish and chips, and shark fin soup. And now we worry they will become endangered. How odd. I think this quote you know, pretty much sums up the opinion about the dogfish as well as its status. Um, and this can apply to other species as well, um, so not only to the dogfish. But currently, there's a commercial dogfish fishery in both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans. And the dogfish started being used by the Native Americans as both food and sandpaper. Their skin is very rough, so it works for that purpose. Um, and eventually, the setters, settlers used the oil from the dogfish as lantern oil. Um, dogfish are also a very good source of vitamin A and better than codfish, actually. Um, they are most popular in Europe, where they're consumed in um, fish and chips. And because of this popularity, the European stocks of dogfish have been steadily declining due to the fishing pressures placed on that stock. Um, which has in turn put pressure on the U.S. and Canadian stocks of dogfish since we often export our catch to Europe. In response, these U.S. and Canadian stocks have been decreasing in overall number and also the number of large females is steadily declining. Dogfish are usually caught in trawls, as you can see in this picture here, um, but they can also be caught on hook and line. One study I conducted used trawl data supplied by the Maine Department of Marine Resources and the Maine Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory. On this map, you can see where Mount Desert Island is in relation to the rest of the Gulf of Maine. It's in the red circle. Um, but I focused my work on sharks closer to the coastline and between mid-coast Maine, so around the Portland area, to the Canadian border. I was using this data to look for trends in the proportion of males and females through time, as well as the proportion of females greater than 80 centimeters. I was particularly interested in these larger females because 80 centimeters is the size at which they mature. And once a female is mature, she's almost always carrying a litter of pups. This is important because the fishery targets the large sharks. And in the case of the spiny dogfish, females will attain a greater length than the males. Therefore, the pregnant females are the target of the fishery. And by understanding their movements, we can better understand when they will be most vulnerable to fishing pressures. The second study I conducted focused on pup development and gestation patterns in the dogfish. The majority of my work was based on a 1947 study conducted near Cape Cod. I collected pups from sacrificed females at MDIBL and took length measurements of both the moms and their pups and to use that to look for both within and between litter development and I compared these results to other published studies. I found that females were only fertilizing one litter at a time and that pups would be in one of two developmental stages. The earlier, they were either a candle stage, the earlier stage, which you can see on the left-hand side, uh, the left-hand picture, or they would be in a nearly fully developed stage with a very small yolk sac, which you can tell from the middle picture here. My third and final study was a comparison of the genetics of dogfish from different ocean basins. I obtained tissue samples from the Gulf of Maine, the North Pacific, and the Shetland Islands. From these tissue samples, I was able to obtain 
genetic sequences, and I used three portions of their genetic code, two of which I used to develop phylogenetic trees, an example of which you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. This was done in an effort to determine relationships between populations within this species, but phylogenetic trees can also be used more broadly to determine relationships between different species. The phylogenetic trees I created showed me that there was some separation between the North Atlantic and North Pacific populations. These results can have fisheries management implications because it may indicate that a distinction needs to be made between the populations within this species and different management objectives and policies may need to be implemented for different ocean basins. Like Sean said, following graduation, I will be heading to Florida to work as a seasonal staff member with the Sea Turtle Conservation and Research Program, where I did my internship in the summer of 2008 at Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota. As usual, there are many people to thank, um, and I would be happy to take your questions. What caused you to pick the dogfish to study? Okay, so what caused me to pick the dogfish to study? When I first started um, thinking about marine animals, I wanted to study sharks. As Sean will tell you very much, I had to study sharks. That was the rule. And, um, and it just so happened that uh, the genetics course I took at MDIBL did the population genetics work on the spiny dogfish. I was in there with uh, Casey as well for that course. And so that kind of started my relationship with um, researchers at the lab and my interest in genetics. So, and it was, you know, accessible to me, and I got a, a massive amount of experience working with this species. And then I ended up doing an internship at Moat in the sea turtle program, so now I'm stuck between the two and can't decide <laughs> where I'd want to go for, for graduate school, which I hope to pursue starting next fall. Yes? I just have a comment. I'm a trustee member of the Buildings and Grounds Committee. And I can attest to the fact that Emily is also a writer and the most faithful uh, conveyor of minutes of any committee I've ever been on. <laughs> and one more point, which is that, as you can tell, she's a very mature scientist and probably a mature botanist as well, because the committee has agreed to eliminate the the um, Norway maples from this campus, uh, a project that I have supported for many years and didn't have to get into with the committee at this time. So thank you, Emily, for all you do for CLA. Thank you. <laughs> Average is six to seven, but you can have anywhere from one to fifteen. Great. Thank you, Emily. Thank you.